All right. Welcome to the February webinar. Uh, I am excited. This is my first opportunity to host the CloudSmith webinar. My name is Sean O'Dell, and uh, I just want to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be talking about containerization or containers or whatever terminology or verb or noun or adjective, whatever you might want to use uh, to, uh, to talk about this subject. And it's really about best practices and getting started. And so with that, I'm really just excited to have everyone here today. A couple of things before we introduce our guest of honor uh, today. I want to you know, mention if you are out on Twitter or out on LinkedIn, on the social networks, please repost the live stream. Uh, really, we, we do this for, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously to get more folks involved. And number two, is to give you an opportunity to be a winner. And uh, we definitely want everybody to win. At the end of the show today, at the end of the, you know, of the episode, we're going to be doing a, a giveaway. And so stick around. Uh, we would love for you to ask questions in the chat uh, if you have any comments, anything like that. And all, as always, because I'm a fan of the emoji, please say hello with an emoji and welcome from where you are. If I was not doing this, I would actually post a welcome from the great state of Texas with the cowboy hat emoji, but I can't. So enough about me and let's get on to today's show. I want to welcome uh, really a, a fantastic guest, a knowledgeable, a, a guest that I think will bring a lot of insight to the conversation of containers and con containerization. Uh, and I'm going to bring in Rory McCune from Datadog. Rory, welcome to the show today, man. Glad to have you. And if you don't mind, introduce yourself a little bit more because I obviously did not do enough. Hi, Sean. Great stuff. Thanks very much for having me along. I'm really glad to be here. Um, yeah, so I um, I guess I've been in containers for a while now. I've been doing container security uh, for about, I've raised about seven or eight years now. So it has been a while. Um, and I've been working around uh, with Docker, Kubernetes, and a lot of different containerization and container security tech. Uh, I'm doing a variety of things there. So, you know, it's been a while. No, very, very cool. And uh, we're glad to have you. Did you ever do any work with Mesos at all at any point in time? I didn't. I kind of came into Docker just as, as it was taking off. And then I got then that kind of led to Kubernetes. So I just kind of I kind of saw the, the, that that container orchestration war from the outside and didn't really get too heavily involved with the other ones. Yeah, you know, th there's obviously a lot. Uh, there's a variety of flavors. I mean, even Amazon has a variety of flavors of how they implement Kubernetes mm -hmm. and containers and containerization, right? Um, and, and really, every organization does it differently. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. I think that's one of the biggest challenges I see when people say things like, oh, Kubernetes security. I say, which of the 140 different <laughs> Kubernetes did you mean when you said that? Because they, they're all different to some extent. And that, that hey, is part of the challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And and we're going to get into some, you know, questions here today and really just a dialogue about about containers and and mm -hmm. you know before we do that, can you give a little bit of you mentioned this a little bit in your introduction and I'll close out a little bit with it later on, but if if you can kind of tell us a little bit about your involvement in Kubernetes and KubeCon uh and some of the SIGs and and a little bit about your uh, your knowledge and sure. depth there. Yeah, so Kubernetes, I've been doing for a while now. I said this has just been about 2016. I probably got involved. And I've done a number of things. There's a couple of things that could be interesting. I've done the CIS benchmarks. So people haven't come across the CIS benchmarks. They're a vendor-neutral hardening guide. And I've been helping out the Kubernetes and Docker ones for about five years now. Um, and that's been very interesting to see how that's evolved and changed. Um, and yeah, I've been lucky enough to present at KubeCon uh, a couple of times. Uh, and I think uh, as my claim to fame, uh, I'm a member of the only unofficial Kubernetes SIG who have ever keynoted KubeCon, which is Sig Honk. Yep. Um, so that, that was a lot of fun. And we've had a chance to do that a couple of times now. That's uh, honk for anybody in the Kubernetes world. There's some fun connotations yeah. and some interesting individuals behind that. And uh, just just love to have that when, uh, you know, we, we were having a little bit of dialogue, obviously getting pre prepped for the show. And I noticed Sig Honk and I was like, I've, I've got to I've got to bring that up in, uh, and let yeah. it be a part of the conversation. Uh, you know, my, my background in Kubernetes is, is extensive as well. Um, having having been a part of VMware, really, when the rise of Kubernetes uh, began, uh, it was it was interesting, even even pre Heptio, pre Pivotal. Uh, you know, we we were doing things within the Kubernetes space, focused on even creating our own Kubernetes engine. There was an announcement made at one time, and I happened to be on the beta of that uh, from an internal team perspective, right? So it's it's always interesting when we talk Kubernetes, we talk containers, and talk containerization. Now, 
the other thing, you know, I think we'll, we'll kind of hear about today is you can do containers without Kubernetes, right? This is nothing new for everybody on the call today. You're on the, on the webinar today. You're probably like, no, we, we, we started here. We started there, right? Um, oftentimes these terms, these phrases, really just the different uh, things that we're discussing around this space often kind of mesh and sometimes they don't have to. Yeah. And so yeah, I'm I, I, to, to the conversation on that. No, I think it's interesting actually, because you say that and it's a good point. I, a lot of times I used to be a pen tester and I used to advise customers about containers and, and container security. And they'd say, no, we're doing Kubernetes. And I would spend time with them and go, you really, really need <laughs> Kubernetes because it's quite complicated. Yep. You know, could maybe just start with Docker um, and get some containers out there. And I think that, that for a while, it's been that sort of thing where it's become Kubernetes is very front of mind. People start there and perhaps sometimes, you know, yeah, start with something simpler. Start with serverless containers, start with Docker. You might find that does what you need. And if it doesn't, sure, then Kubernetes is there. You know, it's not going away. Absolutely. And and you've, you've you know, it's funny, we already mentioned serverless and containers and Kubernetes right. and orchestrators versus Docker, right? Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, yeah. um, there's a lot of ways to solve challenges, problems um, within this space. And I think that's what this conversation is about today. So let's yeah. uh, let's jump into it. My, my, my favorite question um, by far is, uh, what is container or what is containerization or what are containers mm -hmm. and a preface to that? What is the 2023 definition? Yeah. Because that's going to be the interesting one. So go for it. it. Is, yeah. I saw so this. I, let me try and see what I can think of for this. Containers always come across to me the way they've ended up. They've been used for lots of different things, but it's all about delivery and management of apps and being this portable independent way of doing that. And what I always think of containers or Docker as being, or containerization as being, is like the Goldilocks solution, right? So it's it's lighter weight than virtual machines and physical servers, but anything lighter than that, and you start to have to manage, you have to change your app and like change the way it works. Whereas I think that the light of containers, the reason I like them so much, is you can take pretty much any application, drop it in a container, and it works. So you get that kind of like, you know, it just works feeling. And that's honestly where I think even now, after all these years of containers, it's like, that's the, the real thing. It's like, yeah, I did this and it worked, uh, which is nice. Enough. Yeah. And, and I appreciate the fact that you started the definition off with why we are doing this anyway. Yeah. It is the delivery and management of applications. Um, if, if, if I was to look, everybody's had this conversation, whether we've been at KubeCon or talking with other, you know, peers or different, you know, customers and so on. But at the end of the day, we often have a lot of opinions about the technology. We have to have a lot of opinions about why we love our certain, you know, piece of technology, but really we are talking about delivery of applications and we are talking about management of applications. So why, why make that distinction in your mind that this is a, that are, that the fundamentals of this is about application delivery and, you know, bringing value versus mm -hmm. let's just jump to the tech. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I suppose I, I kind of come from that point of view because that's, it's like, it's, 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 it's a use case. It's what you actually want to get out of it at the end of the day. Um, and I love the tech as much as everyone else. You know, I, I can spend hours um, like tinkering around with the details of exactly how you configure them. And for me, it's like how you secure them or break them, all this sort of stuff. But but yeah, you can, you can I think you can lose yourself there. Um, and and um, and I think whatever you do, it's about solving a business problem. And, and that is, to me, that's the business problem containers solve. And hopefully the one they will, I don't see it changing. You know, you kind of get this hype cycle affair where people are like, you know, it's going to go up and it's going to down. For me, containers have come through that now. And it's a steady state where I don't see anyone saying we're going to replace containers because I don't know what you would replace them with. They're here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and it's funny, you come from your point of view. I'll bring my point of view. Mm. Uh, I started as an infrastructure admin and architect, right? And, and really my entire world was central or it was centralized and focused on infrastructure. And, and I think what's, what's, what's occurred over, you know, history, I always laugh because, you know, look, I worked in, in a Fortune 150 organization. My job was infrastructure and, and security and enterprise management. And there was a, definitely a little bit of a love-hate relationship with application owners and application mm -hmm. teams at the time. But what's evolved is there's now almost a, I don't want to say a marriage, but there's a, a closer knit um, you know, relationship between the infrastructure and the applications that has occurred, just whether it's technology or, you know, br bringing down of barriers and so on. But I actually think containers 
have actually helped bring that closer together, right? That marriage or that 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 partnership uh, is is even more solid today between the application owners and the infrastructure, or or now even DevOps or platform teams. So I, I love to talk about kind of the maturity of containers and containerization. Yeah, it is really interesting. I mean, I, I mean, my background I go back far enough um, was in in IT security and banks, a, a world where you know everything was on prem. The, the concept yep. of cloud, what's that? And you're right, the, the move there, I mean, I also remember that when we did projects there, you would talk in months to do a prototype and years oh, yeah. to get a project. And now it's hours or even less than hours to, you know, you can launch an entire application in a cloud account using a container. You could have it done in, you know, 10, 20 minutes tops, no problem. Yeah. And that change is just, just vast. And that, and it's good because it obviously means everyone could do things quickly, but as a security person, it's bad because things change so quickly, knowing what's going on is much more difficult than a world in which oh, you yeah. could have static firewalls where there's a change request that goes through <laughs> to change it. That world is long gone. And I think hopefully now when people in kind of the world I come from have kind of realized that's not for coming back, right? We're not going back to that world, I don't think. Yeah, I, I have no desire to go back to the weeks or even hours of time it takes to get applications and infrastructure deployed and provisioned. Uh, and and since we're talking about dating ourselves, you mentioned it earlier. I was I was working on CIS benchmarks over 20 years ago for yeah. physical servers and Windows and Linux machines. So you know we, uh, you know it, it's funny how our the technology changes, but as I, as I mentioned, applications and, and and management of those applications and providing value to the business, as you mm -hmm. said, is really what this is all about. So very very good. What, one last comment on that? Um, no, I think, I think, yeah, well, actually, I thought the other thing, you asked about containers and what they are now, and it's funny how the other thing that, that struck me is the complete merging of terms. So if you look at serverless, serverless and containers used to be distinct, and now they're not distinct anymore, right? Because right. you can run containers in Lambda quite happily, and any other serverless service you choose to use, most of them will now allow containers. And that's where it comes down to this piece of it literally being this app packaging, because the underlying tech is now... Yeah, pick your underlying tech. There's a hundred different ways to run containers. But what <laughs> remains constant is what you're using them for, or should be what you're using constant. Yep. It, it's getting back to the basics. So yeah. that leads to the to, to to kind of this next question, right? Containers are nothing new. Uh, but in some cases, whether it's you know uh, culture, whether it's uh, you're new to the industry or you're new to the space, um, wh where does somebody get started mm -hmm. with containers? Um, and where do you believe they should begin? You can be a little bit opinionated here, uh, and we'll, we'll just kind of flesh it out. So yeah. where do you think folks should get started with containers? If it was me, uh, and I was getting started with containers, where I would start is with a virtual machine running Docker, right? Okay. Docker was originally meant to run on Linux VMs. That was where it came from. That is the simplest and least interfering solution because you're not putting any more layers in place. You can go and inspect everything. One of the great things I love about Docker is it's all just Linux. So you can use Linux tools to expect exactly what that container is doing. You can build that understanding before you start adding those extra layers of complexity, before you start you know, trying Kubernetes or serverless or anything like that. I, I'm a great fan of, of the traditional. And it doesn't feel right calling it traditional, but it has been a while now. So maybe it's traditional Docker VM solution. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not gonna. I, I don't even know where to comment on the word traditional. Uh, so, some folks may not like it, but it's been around for a few years, right? So, so Docker is the starting place, right? Simple getting started. You know, let, let's take it even up a little bit further. If you're a, if you're, um, if you're an application developer, if you're looking to, you know, get started, create a small service, whether it's a, you know, a I don't know, simple API requests, whatever, whatever you're looking to get out of it. You know, besides Docker, what are some of the areas that you would focus on in kind of that initial journey of creating your first container and creating the first application in that, yeah. uh, in that case? I think I probably would start off with like looking at how you build your application into, into a container. Look at the Docker file. Do I actually like, I mean, again, Dockerfile syntax gets a bit of hate, and a lot of people will talk about it and say oh, they want to do something different. <laughs> but I actually like Dockerfile syntax because I can read them. And I'm a great yep. fan of simple tech. Make it as simple as you possibly can, because when you come to debug it, you're going to be happy you did. And so I would keep it really simple. Get a mm -hmm. Docker file, get a basic base image, and then just start adding statements and like trying to run up each container. That's what I used to do. You know, you'd run up, add a new statement, and say, what does that do to my container? Does it, does it work? Does it fail? Nice and fast. You know, um, and then once you've got that base running and you've got your 
image the way you want it, then you can start thinking about compose and you can start thinking about like, I want a database, I want multiple containers, but just slowly building that up from that kind of solid base. But do take time to understand like Docker files. I wouldn't just take them off the shelf and just reuse them. Okay. It's not that hard a syntax, I think. So it's, it's worth doing. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we're talking Docker, we're talking containers getting started, right? There are so many uh, containers or artifacts that vendors have provided, mm -hmm. uh, that different providers have have created and developed, whether it's for, you know, databases or observability or, you know, any of the, you know, tooling in and around this space. And you know, obviously a CloudSmith, the, the concern is, is definitely a the proliferation of packages, including Docker, including you know everything that goes into a uh, into a container or into an application, right? It's it's the artifacts, it's the package management. Yeah. So what are what are some of the things that you think you know in that getting started, right? Besides obviously using Docker and in, in the in the kind of the beginning of the journey, what are some additional areas that maybe outside of Docker or even into maybe some of the open source areas? Uh, that fit into this space that maybe somebody should uh, begin to look at? Maybe is that next step beyond Docker? Yeah. I think the next step beyond Docker, I suppose, well, it, it depends on your on your goal at that point. I mean, if you wanted to go into the cloud, then you want to start looking at basic cloud stuff. How am I going to hook these things together? Because a container on its own probably isn't going to do everything you want. Um, so you're going to need to start looking at that and, and start trying to build up. Um, one thing I would say, because you mentioned kind of like, you know, there's a lot of artifacts that come from lots of places. The issue there starts to be this issue of trust. As soon as you head towards production, be super careful with trust and container images because a lot of people get this one wrong. You know, there's ever 8 million different images on Docker Hub, and there's about 150 ones you might be able to trust depending on how you feel about it. Um, <laughs> be super careful with that. So that, that, that's my security person's hat. I can't talk too long about IT without my security person's hat going on a little bit. So always be careful there. But then it's about kind of building it up and saying, well, you know, do I need to do load balancing? Do I need, and how would I do that? And, and then it's kind of, I feel you kind of split your journey there, right? Because you probably want your cloud of choice. So everyone's got a cloud of choice. And, and, and at that point, you get into that very, very complex world of cloud. But that's where you probably end up next, trying to start scaling, to start saying about how am I going to do this? How am I going to bring it to production? I mean, it's a production app rather than, you know, something sitting on my desktop. Yeah. Um, you get into CI as well and all that kind of stuff. So there's yeah. a lot to think of. There is a lot to think of. And in, 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 I think in, in a, in a follow-up episode, we're actually going to dig deep into the security topics. Um, but the one thing I heard there is while there's so many you know, uh, available images at on Docker Hub, uh, you probably can't trust too many of them. Uh, and we're starting to see more and more attacks and more, more uh, hmm. sophistication in that. And so, you know, I, th I think... Going back, actually, you said it, my security hat will come on pretty quickly too. So no matter what you're doing, whether you're creating an application in, in, in service in, in a container or in a traditional you know, monolith perspective, right? Security is always at the forefront. Um, so my, my you know, next answer would be as always take security is, uh, is kind of that next step, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially once you go to production and you start looking at, as you said, clouds and you know, where am I going to be running this? Uh, you know, IoT and in, in the in the industry four area looks for things even more. Uh, you know, kind of expanding and the expansion there, right? So, so it's yeah. it's interesting as we get started in this um, that it you know it's it's let's start simple, but quickly it's going to expand uh, to to other areas that are valuable, important, and uh, we definitely need to think about. So that that leads me to the next question. Uh, some of the folks watching today and uh, that will be uh, watching in the future, they are seasoned. Uh, they are veterans, right? You use the term traditional for Docker, mm -hmm. which I think is still funny. But let's let's take those folks who've been using and building uh, applications in and around the container uh, ecosystem. Where should they think about, uh, what should they think about, and what are some of the next steps that they should take on this journey? I think, I think it's an interesting one. I think there's, there's obviously a lot going on. And it's one of the great it's benefits and challenges of container ecosystem is how fast it moves, how fast new and the constancy of the new things. You know, I, I do this thing every four months. There's a Kubernetes release. And I go and trawl through the changes every single release to look for interesting ones. And there's this, this one coming up in April, there are 90 new changes uh, coming through. So it's a huge quantity. In terms of things I've seen interesting, which I think are, are if you're seasoned, are, are worth looking into. 
One is we have this concept of containers being ephemeral, right? We all know that containers are ephemeral, mm -hmm. they can come and go. But Kubernetes clusters, maybe not so much. I've seen a lot of people unfortunately fall into this trap of clusters being like pet clusters. Yep. This is really, I think, again, security hack going on. This is a tricky one, not just security though, from, from like maintenance point of view. People need to get practiced at destroying and recreating clusters, trying to get to this like cat clusters as cattle concept because without that, maintaining and upgrading becomes a nightmare. Um, yeah. And if you've got a lot of clusters, you know, you see organizations trying to go back. And I, I, one of these things I do, one of my kind of little hobbies is I scan the internet every day for Kubernetes versions because yeah. a lot of clusters expose the versions. And the number of clusters who are falling off the supported curve and are going into unsupported versions because they're not at this kind of practice. So that one of like, you know, how do I maintain these things is a really, you know, I think a key one. Another thing that I suppose I would be investigating is a bit more into like mixing serverless and things more into your clusters. So this idea of different workloads can work differently. And I think personally, just a personal opinion, I think a lot of people will end up with Kubernetes plus serverless containers as their eventual solution to get away from a lot of the management headaches and a lot of the problems that underlie kind of like maintaining, again, this maintenance problem and trying to get yep. down the amount of time you have to spend on maintenance. It has its own sets of problems, but I just have this <clears> feeling that the, the happy place will end up being there. So if I was, you know, I had clusters and I was thinking what I want to do this year, I'd be investigating serverless containers if I hadn't already. Um, I think that's kind of an interesting area. Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, we talk about businesses, you know, needing applications and delivering of applications from, a, from, a, from an application delivery perspective. You bring up the topic of just because you think you need to run it on Kubernetes or on this particular piece of infrastructure doesn't necessarily mean it has to. I mean, there's even a question in the chat, um, you know, and the, and the question is from, uh, I believe it's Bibic if I'm, if I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize. For a front end app using React, do we use a container or a CDN? Now, I don't think there's a perfect answer for this. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I know. I don't think you're going to be able to be like you should use X or you should use Y. Um, but I think what's interesting, and we'll talk about this a little bit. I'm, I'm curious your opinion. I've always been a fan of run the application where it makes the most sense for your business, for the requirements, for the security, right? For the touch. Like mm -hmm. there's just obviously the you know data resiliency. There's lots of things that go into it. But that being said. Just because you're running uh, or creating an application, it doesn't necessarily have to be a container or maybe it is serverless or maybe it's a function or maybe it's, you know, those types of things. So what are some ways uh, that not only the audience, but just in general, we in the in the in the in the in this space, what are some steps we can take to get to the right answer or to the closest to the yeah. correct or right answer for our organization? I think you end up having to look at the trade-offs you're going to make. And there are quite a few of them. So, I mean, the advantage of containers, and this is the big promise, is you can run the app in test and dev and CI all the same way. Yeah. Serverless, that's that's trickier. But serverless has huge advantages for bursty applications. You know, I, I want to do, suddenly I need to do a thousand um, requests where previously it's running quite slow. And and that, so it, that's the kind of thing where you start thinking of it's to do with, you know, the style of application. What sort mm -hmm. of coding are you using? Is it Greenfield? Or are you legacy? Are you porting a legacy app? In which case, containers or VMs is probably going to be your answer because the app won't take being put to serve. That's why I always think with serverless is like where serverless has its place, I could never see it replacing containers or VMs until um, everyone gets rid of legacy. And I love to be in that day when all the legacy IT goes, but I, I don't think I'll see that one ever. Uh, no. I, no. I, 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 so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think legacy is going anywhere. Um, it would be nice. It would be really awesome. But mm. there's a reason mainframes and AS400s and yeah. all of these things are still sitting in data centers. Um, and hey, it is what it is, right? We, we have to, we have to, I think that's the key, right? We, we're, we're still trying to solve business problems, you know, um, deliver value to the business. But at the end of the day, just because we need it to run in Kubernetes doesn't mean it needs to run in Kubernetes. Right. No. Uh, and, and I actually yeah. put that in, in one of my, uh, I wrote a predictions blog uh, a couple of weeks ago. And in that, I actually talked about, we, we have made our lives so complex just because of our opinions or our technical choices, which has nothing to do with what we're actually trying to do, which is deliver applications. Yeah. The, the complexity point you make is really, really good. And it's the one that always worries me because even Kubernetes, and the important thing to know about it is it's not a full solution. 
it's by design. They uh, they say certain parts of this stack are not our concern. You need to go and get additional things. Yeah. So you're going to need CNI. You're going to need storage. You're going to need networking. You're going to need authentication solutions. You're yeah. going to need admission control. There's just a whole stack of additional. And I look at that and go, that's horribly complicated for a new company. And that's comes out mm-hmm. to this point of probably don't want to start with Kubernetes unless you kind of have to start with something somewhere in a containers, you know, a, a serverless container solution that'll let you scale. It doesn't have all the additional complexity. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so that, that the complexity one probably is the bit that would worry me the most, most about how people are doing containers is I've been doing this for, I said, you know, eight, nine years now containers. I still learn things every week. Oh, yeah. um, you will never stop. <laughs> well, it's interesting. You you didn't even mention observability and monitoring and yeah. traces and all of that fun stuff. Um, th- th- there really is, right? I, you know, I've 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 had a in depth view of the service mesh world for years now. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, observability and the different components of pieces. Complexity is not necessarily a bad thing, and I and I want to be careful with that. Actually, as I as I as I reread my uh, predictions blog after it got posted, I was like, wait, some folks might actually see that I was negative in some way towards containers or or, or Kubernetes or, or you know in that sense. But at the end of the day, delivering value to the business and and helping reduce that complexity, however you choose to solve it, is is always the right answer for the organization. And obviously, we have opinions. Uh, okay. And and there's going to be trade offs, and we've been doing this for a long time, um, and so it's definitely fun to see kind of the maturity. Uh, but really, that is kind of that next step in the uh, in the uh, for the seasoned veteran is how to mm-hmm. maybe reduce some of those complexities uh, and 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 make their lives a little bit easier. Um, you know, you you mentioned something, and I want to go back to this because you actually said. Uh, containers or the ecosystem, whether it's Kubernetes or serverless or all of the necessary components in and around containers, it moves so fast. Mm. Uh, what, are some, what are some practical ways that you have found to stay on top of the very fast, uh, you know, moving, uh, I would call it a, 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 a large ship at this point. Yeah. Sorry, Kubernetes joke in there. Um, but uh, what, uh, you know, how do you how do you handle that? What are some tips and tricks for for, yeah. for moving so fast and staying on top of it? I guess I guess it depends on like how focused you are on it. If you're super focused on it, weirdly, one of the best ways is actually participating in the project. So if you actually there's, there's there are slacks for Kubernetes um, as and you can join six. So if you're like interested in the area of Kubernetes, yeah. one of the best ways to actually find it. I found so much information I wouldn't find otherwise by being in the right channel on the Kubernetes Slack. Um, and there's some really great people there who are very helpful. That's a good one. Um, social media is all is a perennial favorite, um, whichever social media platform you're on these days. And there are, you know, there's people in different ones. Um, but places like LinkedIn, Twitter, Mastodon started to become more popular, I found in certain yep. you know, tech niches. Um, the, the challenge there is now you've got like three to four different social networks to hang out on. Um, and even places like Reddit as well. You know, the Reddit's a great, there, there's lots of good information. If you find the right subreddit, um, there's good info. So it is kind of this journey where you're just like sucking in information. And then it's like, where do I focus? Because you can't yeah. cover it all. Um, and then just like trying to nail in. The other one, if you get super, like if you get super deep with Kubernetes, especially, and Docker as well, is you will find GitHub is weirdly the best, sometimes the only yeah. place to find your answer. I have on multiple occasions now spent some hours in either GitHub issues or the code itself, belonging around trying to find what I want. Um, so that is like, that's generally, you know, if you really want to know the depth, that's probably where you have to hang out is GitHub. Um, and actually yeah. start looking at PRs and issues, which, you know, you have to be kind of like either very interested or, you know, really needing that information, though. Speaking of social media, this would be a good opportunity to plug mm-hmm. uh, your, what's your Twitter handle, if you don't mind, and Mastodon. Oh, right, my Twitter handle, and generally my handle on most is the same thing. It's Racine, which is R-A-E-S-E-N-E, for a very geeky reason, um, which is basically when I started getting into to kind of like, the internet um it was a handle of a game i was playing it was a name in a game and it was the one thing i could find that no one had taken so you there could you go, go to any given website and have that name um and and that's lasted me like for you know the last 20 years so it's been you know it's worked out pretty well 
you don't have a very common, you know, name, I would say, in the tech space. Uh, neither do I, by, <laughs> by chance. Uh, maybe maybe because of, of, of our lineage and heritage um, in, and where we come from. Uh, my handles are not as cool as yours. Uh, I chose my handle because there was a photographer who beat me to it at one point in time. Uh, he had Sean o or at Sean O'Dell. So I am the Sean O'Dell. That was long before anybody had a the before. <laughs> so I like to consider myself. I was cool in that sense. Uh, but that mine does also stretch across Mastodon, GitHub, uh, LinkedIn, all of the, uh, you know, necessary mediums and, and platforms. So definitely Rory is, is, a, is a great follow. I'm kind of a terrible follow at times because I like to delve into other things that have nothing to do with technology. Um, but you should follow anyway. It's always kind of fun. All right, let's get back to the topic at hand. What are some of the challenges? And this is so broad. So I almost mm. wanted to narrow this down because um, even, even in the chat, some of the folks are actually already articulating some of the challenges mm. um, that they are saying. But what are some of the, let, let's start with, let's start with two top challenges that still remain with containers and containerization. Uh, and then how do you think they will be solved or overcome? So let's just start with one. Let's talk about the first one. We'll discuss it and then we'll shift to the second one. So, I mean, I think to be honest with you, we've already covered, I think we've touched on these because I yep. think that these, these go all the way through it. The, 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 the one that I probably find the hardest or the, thing, the, the one that's the biggest challenge is complexity is that we're building ever and every month that goes by, we add a new thing that comes in and it's more complexity. And I think that there's going to have to be a point where companies you know they rationalize and say actually do i need this 20 you know 20, i mean and you said before it's like if it's bringing business value to the business great but but is there some of that complexity that maybe isn't bringing value to the business or maybe it could be done in a more simple way um that for my money is is how i would be what i'd be thinking about because i just look at some of the stacks now and go how does anyone you know get their head around get that into their head uh, and understand what's going on they, they have a massive team uh attempting to solve the infrastructure operational platform challenges instead of focusing on their core business value, which is delivering applications, right? It, it's, I know that one gets on some people when you start to talk about that. Like we've, we might've, we might've overdone some of this um, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk about challenges. I think that's actually true. You mentioned, you know, whether it's complexity, right? We've talked a little bit about security. We're not going to dive too far down into that one, but security comes up in every conversation every day. Mm. Uh, there are so many different surface, you know, attack, uh, you know, uh, attack points. There are new, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, benchmarks or new findings or new this, right? And it moves fast. So if if you want to if you let's let's talk a little bit about security. We'll, we'll actually look at this a little bit in a, in the follow up question as well. But just what are some things that if if you were to look at the security challenges of mm. of containers today, um, can you can you rattle off a few of those that you think might be super valid and important? You don't have to go too far in the yeah. weeds, but just kind of at, at the surface, what are, what are some of those challenges that you I think see? The first one, I mean, the first one that is a, a, a kind of a. Um, Everything exposed on the internet is the kind of way I would put it to begin with. <laughs> so we've gone through this world where things were not directly exposed. And the problem with everything exposed on the internet, Kubernetes is a good example. So there are around 900,000 Kubernetes hosts directly connected to the internet. Okay. And that means that one mistake in your authentication, one mistake or one bug in, in Kubernetes, right? It's a software, yeah. everything has CVEs and bugs. That will get you into trouble. Uh, and that we've gone through this very hyper-connected world. Um, uh, and, and quite timely at the moment, you've seen companies um, essentially like losing staff and they've, they've been revoking their access thinking, well, all your clusters are right there on the internet. So, you know, how careful are you being? So there's lots of different threats. And we've seen a lot of attackers doing things like compromising developer laptops as a way. And again, all your stuff's straight on the internet. So yeah. before you could maybe cut off all their access by getting rid of a VPN, right? That was the old way it used to work. Everything went through the VPN. Now you can't do that anymore. If someone compromises one of your developer's laptops, you're going to have to scramble across how many systems? Do you even know yep. where they are? Yep. Do you, you, talk, you mentioned observability. Do you even know every service that your people have got access to though, so that when that happens, you can react quickly? So that part of a combination of exposure plus attackers is big. The other one, which obviously is getting a lot of press, and, and rightly so at the moment, is supply chain. which is, okay. It's another complexity problem. Because we've got all these applications that have hundreds of libraries as you know, sitting underneath the actual code you've written. 
And now it turns out that attackers have worked that out. I, 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 weirdly, I always think of security people, you're, you're at like Cassandra, right? You make prophecies that no one will believe. Um, but, and I actually did a talk in 2015 about this exact problem, about supply chain yep. security and about what happens if an attacker takes out one library that you use and how there's really no great solution. Luckily, there are people working on that now uh, and it's getting better. But still, that's the one that like, you know, do you know about every application library that's written? Do you know who wrote it? You probably don't know who wrote it. Do you know what their situation is, who they work for, what their background is, how secure are they? No, you don't know that either. You don't probably know who they are, even if you know all of the versions you've got. So it's, it's that kind of, that's some of the complexity problem, right? Um, but those are the two ones I think that really, I think about a lot when we're looking at this space. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, obviously CloudSmith, from from our perspective, this is the this is the question we get asked on a you know hour to hour basis, talking with customers and prospective customers and prospects and all of that. Look, supply chain is is like in, in some ways we solve some complexity challenges with CI C D and continuous, you know, integration, continuous delivery, continuous testing and building run books. And we've we've we actually solved a lot of the complexity. Um, by automation, but when you inject, as you said, one compromised library, yeah. that entire that entire uh, you know process and pipeline and supply chain is now compromised. And the the challenge I see is nobody has a clue where it is. Right? Where did this happen? Why did this happen? Mm. What systems are affected, right? How, how many containers do I have running out there that are now compromised because of this? And so this is probably, you know, I don't want to go too far on this. Like we could we could sit here and talk for hours about this specific <laughs> subject um, in our in our, in our follow up to this. Uh, we will actually dive deep and, and actually drill into some of those challenges uh, and, and talk about a lot of the like the intricacies. Um, I mean, we haven't even mentioned SBOM yet, right? No. Uh, we have to, we've we've actually mentioned the concept. We haven't talked about um, or or the the components of an SBOM, uh, but we haven't actually talked about it in general, right? So it's 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 interesting how all of this goes back to just kind of a new introduction of technology in this containers. We've solved a problem here. Then we introduced a little bit more complexity. Then we solved another problem here, right? And it's just this continual, you know, mm. process uh, that we're on, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, but it, at the same time, it can also be a, a struggle and a bad thing. So, um, you know, any, any final comments on the topic around, you know, container security, uh, you know, the problems that we're trying to solve and obviously supply chain uh, attacks that you mentioned? I think, I, I think it, it, yeah, we're right. We, we have got supply chain problems right now. It's good to see, and I'll mention the OpenSSF. If people haven't looked into OpenSSF, good foundation. They're doing a lot of great work on trying to address this problem. It's not a quick fix. This is the thing that I think is a big challenge with supply chain is no one can tell you, just do this and you fixed it. Yep. They can help. They can provide you with tools. They can provide you with advice, but they cannot fix it quickly. It's, yep. it's, it's going to be a problem for, you know, forever. Um, I, and again, I actually would bring it back to the message I had before about complexity and trying to reduce complexity. I try to think of library dependencies as being kind of like, it's like nuclear power, right? It's great, you use them, they get you there faster, they do something for you, but then you have to manage the radioactive waste. And that's all the maintenance you have to do on all of these libraries. So every time you add another library to a project, think about that's the more radioactive waste I then have to manage. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, it's, an op it's a cost. And it's that that, Hopefully that might, I think for me, the, one of the best things you can do to help your supply chain security is say, you know, do I need 500 libraries here? Can I maybe get that down by 100? If, if I have, then fantastic. I've just made my life easier. You know, I will not have to, that report that says, hey, you got these vulnerabilities will be somewhat smaller. It's all about that journey to try and like reduce your complexity again. Yeah, limiting the attack surface is, yeah. is, is, the, uh, is the biggest challenge uh, in that sense. Um, so, so to close things out, right, we have... You know, we, we've talked a lot about containers, Kubernetes, uh, you know, obviously exploring serverless containers and and really just in general about application delivery and, and the challenges in and around the space. So is, as you, you know, kind of last question, I'll give you an opportunity to to kind of open this up and just, you know, talk about the your, your remainder for 2023. What are some things that you're going to be focusing on in and around this space that maybe we've talked about, mm -hmm. but if you could detail maybe where you um, are, are, are looking to focus or, or maybe yeah. some of the things that you're hoping we solve in and around this ecosystem uh, based oh. upon these challenges we've discussed. 
Yeah, I think in terms of the focus I'm going to have, it's going to be um, it, it's <clears> going to be around maintaining complexity of Kubernetes. One of the things I'm actually interested in doing, I talked a bit about fundamentals, is I've actually started doing some post around fundamentals. So trying to do some stuff around here is containers and here's how they work. Because I think the best thing I ever did when I learned containers was went down to the basics and worked my way up. Because now when I get a new thing, it's just like a little bit extra and I kind of have this base to sit on. So if I was advising people, you know, that's the thing to do is this, to work from that base and work your way up. Know what's going on underneath the covers. Um, in terms of stuff, that will be one for me is trying to explain more to people about that. I think the other thing is just trying to keep up with Kubernetes. There's a new, so the way Kubernetes does admission control, there's a new inbuilt version of that um, coming along, which is going into alpha in the next release. So it's going to be that, that constant process of what's coming with Kubernetes now and can you keep up along with keeping up with all the other things I think we've been doing. Yeah, there's just so much to do uh, in, in finding finding that focus. And I think you actually said it a couple times, is nobody can solve every problem, right? There are a variety of challenges. Some of them take very specific focus and niche. Um, I, I laugh back in the day, you know, when, when, when we started getting into, you know, traditional monitoring tools and the, the Microsoft, op, you know, the, the Microsoft's mom and, you know, just kind of the, 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 the build out of, of all of those tool sets. There was always this idea of having a single pane of glass. Uh, and I've never prescribed to that. I do not believe in that. It's, it's nearly impossible. Uh, and so as, as we go into 2023, I look forward to every organization, every open source project whether commercial organizations, right, um, uh, you know, governing bodies or SIGs, uh, obviously, you know, uh, CIS and, you know, really just everybody in this ecosystem is solving what they know best and, 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 and focusing on that. Uh, obviously, some folks are far better at different areas than others. Um, you know, different individuals have different, um, you know, all of us have different um, expertise and different focus. And so to me, that's going to be the biggest thing for 2023 is not trying to solve every problem, but trying to solve each of the little, you know, kind of here and there. And, and as we solve each of those smaller problems or chunks, right, it's going to take a big, you know, effort by a lot of different folks to, uh, to do it. But I think we can get better than where we are today. And so that, that will definitely help out uh, in this idea in, in an area around containerization. So really, really excited really for, for what is happening in this space and, and really want to thank you for the, uh, for the time coming in and talking. Uh, and, and as I close out today, I want to, you know, I want to bring up a few things, uh, especially for you, Rory, because we have KubeCon coming up in April. So if you don't mind, kind of tell us about what you're, uh, what you're going to be doing at KubeCon, any sessions you might have a, you know, a part of, or any of the SIGs and the different things that you will be taking, uh, taking part in. So, yep. The main thing, um, I'll be doing a talk at KubeCon um, with a SIG honk. Uh, so it's myself, uh, Brad Giesemann, uh, Ian Coldwater, and Duffy Cooley. Uh, yep. And we're going to be talking about container vulnerability scanners and how potentially to, we're called, it's called malicious compliance, our talk. And it's about how could clever people try and get past all those nice controls that we put in place or container uh, vulnerability scanners and, 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 and controls. So it should be interesting. I'm looking Absolutely. forward to that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I am as well. And obviously you mentioned some fantastic folks uh, besides yourself on that team. I, I, I had the privilege of working with Duffy at, uh, at, at VMware. Fantastic. And obviously Ian, uh, well-known, well-respected. And uh, if you ever see Ian, obviously Hong is very, uh, very important uh, to them. Uh, and so de definitely bring that up. Uh, a couple other things, you know, from a CloudSmith perspective, we, we obviously are super excited and thankful to have all of you here today. Um, some of the things we are going to be doing, we will be at KubeCon as well. I will be there. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we we, we as, as an organization have updated our Terraform provider so you could manage CloudSmith with, uh, with Terraform. And then a fun one is as we continue to add and expand into upstreams, which is something that we're looking to do, and we've added NPM and Python from an, from an upstream perspective. They're both in early access. And uh, you know, as of now, we support 28 different packages, and we're going to continue to expand that, and obviously up offer upstreams in that. Uh, and so, it really excited. You know, our customers are, are loving that. Really, it's it's becoming a, a common theme. Hey, we need upstreams. We need X, right? Um, and so, it's good to hear. Uh, and then the other thing is, not only will we be at KubeCon, we will be at the London Tech Show next week, and then I will be in lovely New York City. 
the week after. Uh, but the other thing that we want to announce today, and actually I'm going to hold on. Let me do the, uh, the winners first, and then I've got one more big announcement. So our winners for today uh, is a Jonathan Burlback. He is a getting a prize pack. Congratulations to Jonathan. Uh, that looks like Swin or Sh- uh, I'm going to say Swin. I'm going to so totally butcher that name. Uh, Abig uh, Bite, uh, a prize pack as well. And then uh, Wiley Lang, prize pack, and Matthew Greiner, a free lunch. And Hillary will be reaching out to all of you uh, for that. But the big announcement is this. We are announcing Unpacked. Unpacked as a conference uh, that we are excited about that Cloudsmith is putting on, focused on DevOps, package management, uh, supply chain security, and this will be virtual. And uh, we're going to be having this in a couple of months. So if you go to unpackedconference.com, we would love to have you sign up. It's, you know, Go check it out. We haven't announced the full speaker list yet, but we're going to be getting there. I'm excited about that as well. And so with that in mind, Rory, I just want to say thank you. You've been a fantastic guest. Appreciate the opportunity to, be, uh, to speak with you and have you uh, provide your expertise today. Christoph, thanks very much for having me along. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the day, wherever you are, morning, afternoon, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers. Cheers, all.